He has an incredible, incredible wisdom. He was in ministry for 30 plus years in the north of Chicago, right? West side of Chicago. West, Ch West side of Chicago. And has an, just an incredible story. God's done so many good things. I knew the topic we're talking about today was one I wanted him to come in and share about. We've been going through, if you're not familiar, we've been walking through the first few chapters in Genesis. And how we can look at the origins and what God's original design was and use that as information that will teach us how we should live today. It's no surprise we all know the world is broken and it is not as it should be. There are things in this world, in us and in others, and in the brokenness of the world that cause us and that cause this world, to, the experience in this world, to be not as God intended it to be. So when we look back at the original design, we can discover not just how God wanted us and designed us to be, but how we can change and we can live and we can think and we can walk differently today, understanding who we were created to be by the Lord. So that's the series we're in today. Dave's going to bring a really important topic to us. Dave, come on up. Would you give him a hand, please? Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It must be on. Yeah. Mm, thanks. Thank you, Jason. I, uh, I appreciate Jason because when we meet together as pastors, uh, Jason generally agrees with me <laughs> when it comes to theology or things like that we uh, have some similarities and I always appreciate that so well I played hockey until I was about 66 years old and I, I love skating I love skating on the ice, or well, as is where you skate. I love being on the ice. I like the coolness. I like being in the arena. I love playing defense. I mean, it's such a challenge. It's everything about it. For me, playing hockey was so life-giving. But as life-giving as hockey was for me, I couldn't ignore my back and my neck. And so, no more hockey for me. It's disappointing. But, in the grand scheme of things, hockey is of minor importance. There are other far more significant endeavors in life that have the potential to fill our lives with meaning and joy. They enable us to grow and flourish in life. They are life-giving. Uh, many find work to be life-giving. Others, not, not so much. But then, there, of course, there's friendship. And then there is marriage. Now, work and friendship and marriage have far more potential to be life-giving than recreational hockey. But in order to realize the life-giving potential we must invest ourselves far more deeply in these things because these endeavors are far more challenging for us in life. As Christians, we know that fullness of life is found through faith in Jesus. And ultimately, it is Christ in us that enables us to experience life-giving relationships with one another. So this morning we're going to be in John chapter 2 and in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 as well. And we're going to be focusing on marriage. Now I'm sure not everyone here is married. And well, every pastor's nightmare is to try to take a very specific topic and make it applicable to everybody. I'm sorry, it's just hard to do. So if you're not married... Uh, if you're young and you're looking to be married, well, there might be something here for you. If you're not married and you're older, well, Lord, Lord willing, you are content. And uh, you are flourishing being unmarried. But if you are married, I'm speaking specifically to you this morning. I want to just begin by asking this question. Do you enjoy 
a life-giving marriage. Do you enjoy a life-giving marriage? Now we're in John 2, and from verses 1 and 2, I want to just point out that most marriages begin with joy. Most marriages begin with joy. Not all marriages, but most marriages begin with great joy at the wedding. And I think this is true basically all around the world. In verses 1 and 2, we read, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now, I, I'm going to assume that this wedding was a joyful occasion, and I mean, just imagine, there was Jesus. How marvelous would that be, to have Jesus at your wedding? After all, God is the one who established marriage. It is God's idea. And with that in mind, let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. God established the first marriage with Adam and Eve. And I believe that first marriage also began with great joy. It was God who brought them together. In Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Then in verses 21 to 25, we read, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Adam, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. As Adam was naming the animals, he realized that there was no one who corresponded to him. And so God put Adam into a deep sleep. He took a rib, or more literally, a side out of Adam. And he made a woman, and he brought the woman to Adam. And Adam began to realize that, oh, here is someone with whom I can find fullness. Someone with whom I can find wholeness in my life. Was he happy? Was he joyful? Well, I think so. Because he says, oh, this is now bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. It was joyful. So I want to consider this text a little more deeply. In chapter 2, verse 18, we read that God is going to make a suitable helper. And I want to point out that from every indication in this text, Adam saw Eve as his full equal. When God made Eve, it wasn't so that Eve could be a gopher for Adam. The word helper does not mean that Eve was a diminished version of Adam. Nor does it mean that Eve was just there to bear children for Adam. Adam and Eve were equal. Both experienced dominion. Both had dominion over the earth. Both were to be fruitful and multiply. Both were in a relationship with God. In fact, in the Bible, the word helper is usually applied to God himself. And God is certainly not inferior to us. In this text, we learn that marriage requires leaving, it requires unity, and it requires intimacy. The husband and wife, they leave their parents. Now, this idea of leaving is, is very important. 
and it has it, it, it means more than just like moving out of of the house of of your parents a life-giving marriage is possible when when both husband and wife have learned to be able to stand on their own feet in life They're, they they are not dependent upon mom and dad for finances or or any other kind of support now i'm not saying that uh, parents should never help in any of these ways. Our parents are often deeply involved uh, in our marriage relationships. And, and, and we who are married are generally deeply involved with our parents if relationship is good. And we may be more involved with our parents than we ever thought we would be as they would grow older. So I don't mean that there's no ongoing relationship, but... Husband and wife are standing together on their own, depending on one another, supporting one another. And then there is the importance of being united together. The old King James has the word cleave. Other translations have hold fast. The idea is being stuck together like glue. A life-giving marriage is possible when husband and wife cling to each other in all of life until death. The husband is present to support and encourage his wife. The wife is present to support and encourage her husband. They face life together. They make decisions together. They work out their differences together. And then, of course, there is the becoming of one flesh. When we hear that phrase, we tend to think of sexual intimacy and uh, consummating a marriage. In fact, in the United States, failure to consummate the marriage is, uh, gives legal grounds for divorce or annulment. But becoming one flesh is more than just sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is expressive of the reality, the reality that husbands and wives are creating, constantly creating a unique oneness that reflects the image of God. The woman was made from the side of the man. Husbands and wives bring oneness to each other by an ongoing growing together in body, soul, heart, and mind. And in the protection of that kind of love, children are brought into the world. Such oneness creates the context to be able to see children as a blessing from God. Oh my, look what God has put together here. How wonderful. Let me suggest that what we see in Genesis 2 describes the ideal marriage. No married couple since Adam and Eve has ever experienced this ideal. But most of us go into marriage very idealistic when I was a pastor in Chicago and I would sit down with a couple for premarital counseling one of the early questions I would ask is now I want you both to write down ten reasons why you want to marry the other and then I would ask each to read their list to their fiance oh my you would think that these were the most perfect people ever. You, he is so kind. He listens so well to all that I have to say. You know, oh, she is so patient. She is so kind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of us go into marriage with our eyes half closed. And that's probably a good thing 
in some ways, maybe not completely, but it is a good thing to fully intend to leave one's parents. It is a good thing to intend to cleave to each other. It is a good thing to think the best of one another as we go into marriage. And entering into a one flesh relationship is, is tremendous. But while most marriages begin with joy, I can say clearly that all marriages experience challenging disappointments. All marriages experience challenging disappointments. The wedding at Cana had a great start. Everybody was happy, the band was playing, the bride and groom was dancing, the wine was flowing, until we get to verse 3. It says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Oy vey, the wine has run out. There was great concern, great disappointment, and, and even Jesus seems to indicate that, well, wait, this isn't my responsibility. I wasn't in charge of getting the wine, right? I want to use that picture as a metaphor for marriage. You see, all marriages experience a variety of challenging disappointments. So let's, let's go back to Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve experienced great disappointment because they disobeyed God. Their sin, their disobedience brought guilt and shame. Disorder, disunity, confusion, Chaos entered into the world and into the heart of every person. And as we know, sin brings destruction and death. There isn't one of us who has not experienced the destructive brokenness of guilt and shame and sin in our lives. Adam and Eve decided to make their own way apart from God and they experienced the sad consequences. Thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. Listen to Genesis three sixteen to 19. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. God said this, with painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. What a tragedy. This is why I can easily say that no marriage since Adam and Eve has ever experienced the ideal marriage. We all go into marriage with idealistic hopes and dreams, but we are all deeply broken. Again, it's why I can say with, with, with conviction that all marriages experience challenging disappointments. So let, let's think about this. Genesis 3.16, God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Whereas in Genesis 2, Adam and Eve were, were equal partners in life, now there is conflict between them. Instead of both having dominion over the earth, hus the husband asserts his dominion over his wife. Instead of both bringing their strengths together in a mutual endeavor, there is competition for power in the marriage relationship. In my understanding of this passage, 
This is the beginning of patriarchy. Patriarchy came after the fall. Men used their strength to dominate women both in marriage and society. It does not bode well for women. It does not bode well for marriage. And in this world, we see the fruit of patriarchy every day. But wait, there's more. We are all broken people. I don't just mean that we are all sinful. No, we are all broken. When we get married, we may leave our parents, yes, but many of us have been deeply hurt by mom and dad. Maybe there was addiction in the home when you were growing up. Maybe there was divorce. Maybe your mom or dad abandoned the family. Maybe there was verbal, emotional, or sexual abuse. And even though we physically leave our parents, we carry scars and wounds from our parents into our marriage. And then, of course, our society provides each of us with any number of negative, destructive experiences as we are growing up. Maybe you were bullied, made to feel worthless, a failure. Perhaps someone outside of the family abused you in a, one way or another. I mean, let, let's be honest. We all carry into our marriage any number of negative and sinful habits, ways of being and thinking. Some of us find it just absolutely impossible to admit that we are wrong and to apologize. Do you know anyone like that? Hmm. Others enter into marriage carrying some deep secrets. Some enter into marriage with deep resentment and explosive anger. And all of these things easily breed hard-heartedness. You remember in Matthew 19, the Pharisees asked Jesus about whether it is lawful to divorce one's wife. And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it wasn't this way from the beginning, Jesus said. You see, at the end of the day, many, if not most, divorces take place because of hard-heartedness. There is an unwillingness to be accountable. There is an unwillingness to change. There is an unwillingness to forgive. And in addition to all of this, let me add that the general heartache and sadness of life in this old creation world often increases our unhappiness and disappointment in life. Sickness, financial ruin, natural disasters, death. It can leave such deep heartache that some marriages never recover. The joy has turned to disillusionment and sadness and sometimes divorce just cannot be avoided. Now depending on your background, depending on the way your life has unfolded, you, you may have taken many good qualities into your marriage. I mean, most of us grow up and mature. Most of us learn how to get along in life and how to get along with, with others. We try our best. But because the reality of sin and brokenness runs deep in this world and in our lives, despite our best efforts, in one way or another, our marriage will experience challenging disappointments and heartache. And if you don't believe me, just turn on country music on your radio. But I want to point out that even though all marriages experience challenging disappointments, your marriage can be life-giving with Jesus. 
your marriage can be life-giving with Jesus. Back in Cana, the wedding celebration seemed to have come to an early end. No more wine, no more dancing, no more joy. But there was one person, one wedding guest, who had the ability to restore the wine, to restore the dancing, to restore the joy. And of course, you know, I'm talking about John the Baptist. No, I'm talking about Jesus, right? Jesus. Listen to John 2, verses 5 to 11. Jesus' mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, You know, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Jesus told those servants to fill up those uh, empty jars up to the brim and then he told them to take some to the master of the banquet. When the master of the banquet tasted it, it was, he was filled with joy because it was the best wine he had ever tasted. The cheap wine had run out. And Jesus revealed his glory by miraculously providing 180 gallons of the best wine ever. Wow. <laughs> Who would think that Jesus would use his divine power to provide, provide wine for a wedding celebration? Well, if Jesus was willing to rescue a wedding, how much more is Jesus interested in rescuing a marriage? We know that Jesus came into the world to bring fullness of life and joy through the forgiveness of sins. In John's Gospel, again and again, we read about how Jesus wants to give us eternal, an eternal kind of life. His eternal kind of life. That life does not begin when we die. That life begins when we surrender to Jesus in faith and receive him as our Lord and King. If you have Jesus, you have his life in you. It is a life that is meant to be lived out in all that we do in every relationship that we have. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you are one who is learning to daily count the cost and take up your cross to follow him. You are seeking to die to yourself every day that you might live for Jesus Christ. Many of us are familiar with Galatians 2.20. Paul writes this verse, I have been crucified with Christ. And what's the next line? Anybody know? And I no longer live. What? what? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Whose life is Paul living? His own? Or Jesus? That's a trick question. <laughs> because in some ways it's both, right? But it's Christ in us. And we are seeking to live as Jesus would live if he were you or if he were me.
maybe you're thinking, well, Dave, what does this have to do with marriage? It has everything to do with cultivating a life-giving marriage that can weather the many different kinds of disappointment that we experience in life. Self-denial and a deep trust in Jesus is the foundation for a life-giving marriage. What does self-denial and, and a deep trust in Jesus look like in marriage? Well, it looks like self-giving love, patience, mutual submission, and surrender. It sounds like conversation that is filled with grace, mercy, kindness, repentance, and forgiveness. My, my hope for every husband and wife here this morning is that your joy is to see your spouse flourish in life and in the love of God. Weekly, not daily, but maybe, maybe more daily than week, weekly. No, I, one of my regular prayers is, uh, my wife Angie, is, uh, this is her month to teach the preschool kids in our church, so wh where we go, and so she's there. But regularly, I say, Lord, help me be a blessing to my wife. I, say, I, I am so defensive. Oh, my word. I, sometimes, you know, I'm doing something outside. Angie wants me to plant something here or there, and, and I'm trying to get that plant where she wants it. And, you know, she doesn't say anything bad. Just, oh, could we just turn that a little bit? And I'm like, oh, come on. I've been doing this all morning. And, you know, I mean, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? Well, okay. Our conversation. I, I want Angie to flourish in life. I want her to flourish in her relationship with God. I want to be a blessing to her. I hope you want to be a blessing to your spouse. Okay, I got off track there a little bit. If we're going to do this, it requires a lifelong investment in each other. Jesus' mother told those servants, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. They were to listen to Jesus. And I want to commend that same willingness to all of us this morning. Perhaps your heart is hard because of things that have happened to you or things that have happened in your marriage. Perhaps there are habits, secret sins that are hurting you and hurting your marriage. I urge you, to seek help, get counseling, ask for prayer. Don't wait any longer. Your marriage can become life-giving. And Jesus is more than willing to help you as you surrender to him. So wh where does one begin? Well, I, I would encourage you to begin this week intentionally praying for your marriage, intentionally praying for your spouse, praying for yourself. Surrender yourself before the Lord. Ask God what He would have you do. Listen to the Holy Spirit's leading. God loves you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he wants more than you for your marriage to be life-giving to the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And we long for godliness. We... <laughs> We know who we are, 
And we know the struggles very well. We want to be like Jesus. Help us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.